Yeah, we're in Oilers jungle tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Oilers number, and you are officially in the jungle. Now, you probably already noticed I pronounced this word a little bit funny compared to maybe what you expected, and let's get that straight right off the bat, that it is pronounced Euler. Now, who is this rascal? Euler is a very famous mathematician, and uh, uh, he is simply the godfather of some of the greatest mathematical principles that we study to this day. And um, one of these numbers that he uh, found is so famous that it gave, got its own name. And so we're going to talk about the letter E today. We're going to talk about that it's really no longer a letter, it's a number. And it's 2.718281.83. And all in all, it's very similar to pi. It's We're going to talk about it being an irrational number. Um, it's a numerical constant, and it's no longer, we don't want to consider it a variable by any means. So let's make that official. Let's say E is no longer a letter. No, no, no. We now refer to E as a numerical constant. Okay? What do we mean by that? Well, we're basically saying that the value of E is constantly the same. It's going to be equal to... 2.718281828. And that's nine decimal places that the calculator displays for me. Now, we classify E as an irrational number. And of course, that's the opposite of being a rational number. It is considered real, um, but within the realm of being real, it is considered irrational. And that's simply because we cannot express it as a fraction. Okay, we absolutely have to have our calculator for these next couple of exercises. And the first thing, uh, I wish I could give you a prize for the first person to find it, but can you find E on your calculator? Okay, so here it is. It's this little rascal right here hiding above the division key. So what we're going to do every time we want E is it's just simply we're going to hit second and then the division sign and that's going to create our E. There is another one over here on this side of the screen and I don't care which one you use. The key is this one that's over here on this side um, automatically um, creates an exponent and sometimes we want an exponent, sometimes we don't. Of course, if you really didn't want an exponent, you could always put a one in there to satisfy that requirement. So let's practice evaluating a couple of these rascals on our calculator and um, we'll go two decimal places for all of our answers here. And we're just going to practice punching these in and seeing if we can gain some confidence with the calculator. So let's try, first and foremost, let's try the square root of E cubed, okay? Try typing that in. And then come on back and see if you got the same thing I did, rounded to two decimal places. Um, on my calculator, I got 4.48 to two decimal places. Okay, try doing the fifth root of E. And that's a good one to practice. You know, you're probably wondering, oh my garage, I know how to do a square root, I know how to do a cubed root, but where in the world do I get my fifth root? And you'll notice if you go to your math menu, which is going to be this rascal right here, and uh, the fifth choice down, it's, it's just under cubed root. It looks like the x root. And once you enter that, it'll take you back and you can type in the fifth for the root. And I got 1.22. Okay. Um, let's try this. Let's try doing the absolute value of 2 times e all divided by 5, and then we'll subtract 10 from that, close the absolute values. Let's see what you get on there. Did you remember where the absolute values are? All you got to do is if you hit the math button and then go over to the right one menu, you'll see the absolute values waiting there for you. And let's see, I got 8.91 on my calculator. Okay, So I just want you to be really uh, comfortable evaluating different expressions that involve E uh, using your calculator. So I want to introduce you to an exponential function. You'll notice it does fit the mold. Uh, we've got a constant base uh, raised to the variable power of x. And we have a very special name for this rascal. We call him the natural exponential function. OK, the natural exponential function. And what I want to do is talk about how we're going to graph this function. And I'm going to create a table of values. And my goal here today is to create six points. I'm going to round my y values to the nearest tenth today. And I'm going to plot them as carefully as possible. And we'll talk about whether there's any kind of asymptotes in this graph or anything like that. So what I want to uh, encourage you to do here is to, on your calculator, on your own, is to go to y equals. Let's enter in the function e raised to the x. 
we'll have to do the carrot and then add the X in there. And we're going to go to the table of values and let's see what we can copy down here. Like I said, I'm looking for six points that I could transfer over to this graph and get plotted. And um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start with negative two. And that's going to give me, if I go, you know what, I'll go nearest hundredth here. I got 0.14. That'll give us a little more accuracy. Negative one's going to be 0.37. Zero's going to give me one. Shocker right there, huh? One's going to give me 2.718, rounded to 2.72. Two's going to be, let's see, 7.39. And maybe we'll grab one more if it fits. Uh, it's going to be 20.09. That's going to be a tough one to squeeze on there. Uh, but we'll do the best we can. So let's go ahead and plot these real nice. So here's, I, I squeezed on six points the best I can, and I was trying to be as careful and as accurate as possible using my decimal places, and I'm going to connect those points just as smoothly as I can. And of course, we could always hit the graph button on our calculator just to confirm that the general shape matches what it's supposed to. Extend it all the way through as I can. Now what I'm going to add here is there is an horizontal asymptote. You can see the graph starting to trend um, towards that x-axis. As far as the end behavior goes, we'll summarize that as saying, well, as x approaches negative infinity, it's fair to say that f of x, which describes the height of the graph, is approaching zero. And then on the other side, we'd say as x approaches positive infinity, the height of the graph is now approaching infinity. So we do have an asymptote. We want to label it y equals zero. And we're doing a better and better job each day of just remembering to um, gra graph that asymptote as a part of the function. Well, I'll tell you what, we got ourselves a little showdown here. We got uh, two functions already graphed, and uh, one of them represents y equals 2 to the x, and one of them represents the exponential function y equals 4 raised to the x. And I want to see if you guys can take a moment to try to match them up yourselves and figure out which one's which. So the, what caught my eye is we're looking for defining characteristics that are going to distinguish these two graphs from one another. Was I locked in on this point right here, 1, 2. And then I said, ooh, 2, 4. Um, both of those points satisfy this function right here. 2 to the first equals 2, or 2 to the second equals 4. So the red graph is 2 to the x. Whereas the purple graph passes through the point 1, 4, which satisfies this graph, 4 to the first equals 4. So we got that cooking for us. Now my next challenge is, can we graph y equals e to the x relative to these two functions? I think it's going to be really powerful stuff to see how they compare to each other. Now, does everybody agree that 2 is smaller than e, which is smaller than 4? Or in other words, 2 is smaller than 2.718 which is smaller than 4. So what's going to happen is I graph e to the x as I sketch it. It's going to nestle itself right in between these two functions here. Still going to cross the y-axis at 1. And then it's going to continue. Now here's the kicker. It's going to pass through 1 comma e, which is this point right here, right around that point. And then it's going to continue to just kind of, I don't know if bisects the right word, but it's going to stay within the boundary of those two graphs. So let's see if we can graph that. It's going to cut right in there, cross the y-axis at 1. And what I'm doing is I'm aiming for this point right there, the 2.72. And it's going to shoot up just like the other two graphs and kind of stay in the middle of them. So that's what y equals e to the x looks like relative to some other exponential functions you're maybe more familiar with. And of course, there's the ever so important asymptote there right across the bottom at y equals 0. So also in tonight's video, um, I want to introduce you to another new function, and this rascal is y equals the log base e of x. In fact, this, this function is so famous, we created its own special notation, and it's called the natural log of x. And so whenever you see ln just printed like this, you can automatically assume that it's a base E without even having to write the E, which is a nice little shortcut. Okay, and what did we call this bear? His name is the natural log function. This is a very famous function, and it's something we're going to use a lot. Of course, you're more than welcome to put the E in there if you'd like, if that helps you. And I think we'll do that quite a bit tonight in the video just to remind ourselves that the base is E. We'll play another game here. We'll give a prize to the first one to find the natural log button on their calculator. On your mark, set, go! 
And hopefully you found that rascal hiding right here on the left-hand margin. Again, it's so famous, it's so special, he's got his own button right there. Um, so we're going to use this rascal quite a bit tonight. So grab that calculator and let's practice punching a couple of these bears in. Let's uh, try to evaluate the natural log of 8. Punch that bear in, so we're going natural log, then 8, hit enter. And we'll go two decimal places again. I'm looking at 2.08 as a value. And really what we're saying in English, okay, if we read this, we're saying what power of E is 8. In other words, E raised to the power of 2.08 equals 8 itself. Okay, um, let's try the natural log of 1 half and see what we get. So we got natural log, I'm going to go 0 0.5, and I've got negative 0.69. And that kind of makes sense, and we'll explain why later, why it's negative and how you, why you'd expect that to be negative. Um, let's try the natural log of zero. Type in, so we got natural log, we got zero, hit enter. And the calculator kind of freaked out a little bit and gave us the error message. And that corresponds to what we talked about the night before with the domain. So the same domain applies here, that this value inside the parentheses must be positive. In other words, it can't equal zero and it can't be a negative. And we'll just test that out for fun and annoy our calculator. We'll type in the natural log of negative 3, hit enter, and yep, calculator's having problems with that as well. He's giving us an error message. So now we're going to set the calculators off to the side and give them a little break, and we're going to practice evaluating some really special natural log expressions without a calculator. So first things first, if I asked you to evaluate log base 2 of 2, you know, how would you think about how you'd go about that? You're thinking, what power of 2 is 2? And the answer is 1. Or in other words, we're saying 2 raised to the first equals 2, right? Okay. Well, the same thing can be said here. So if I want to do the natural log of E, and you could always remind yourself there's a little miniature E right there. What we're really asking ourselves is what power of E equals E. In other words, E raised to the first power equals E. Okay. So let's try... Let's try the natural log of e squared. Again, what power of e is e squared? And the answer is 2, because e raised to the second power is equivalent to e squared. Okay, put that little note right there to check it. Um, this one's going to be a little trickier. What's the natural log of, let's see, radical e? Which is the same thing as saying e raised to the 1 half power. So what power of e equals e to the one-half? And the answer would be simply one-half. Now what you're noticing here is something that I like to call the zap rule. The natural log of e is a one, and one times two equals two. Okay. Again, the natural log of e is one. One times a half is a half. Let's test that theory on another example here. Um, let's see, we'll call this example number five. Let's do the natural log of e to the fifth power. So what power of e equals e to the fifth? And the answer is five. So again, think of the zap rule. The natural log of e always equals one, and one times five is five. In our next slide, we're going to practice graphing the natural log of x. So help, hopefully your calculator caught its breath. We're going to go ahead and grab that rascal. We're going to y equals. And we are going to type in the natural log of x. And we're going to take a look at that table. And again, I want to round all my answers to the nearest tenth. All right. So we're thinking x values, y values. Um, you know, at, when I was at 0, it gave me an error message. Um, at x equals 1, we got 0. At x equals 2, I got 0 0.69. At x equals 3, we got 1.10. Rounding to the nearest tenth, bump that up. And then I got at x equals 4, we got 1.39. You notice the function still increasing, but not at a very fast pace. In other words, this is one of those functions that increases at a decreasing rate. And we'll see if we can plot these points. Now perhaps the most valuable thing you could do as you're plotting those points is to remember, because the function's undefined at 0, there's going to be this vertical asymptote here. The graph's going to merge closer and closer to it without touching. So my sketch might look something like this. Function's increasing, but at a decreasing rate. 
And of course, we've got that asymptote at x equals zero that always needs to be there. And uh, no surprise that the y or the x-intercept was a one. Um, I meant to mention earlier, uh, I've discovered this really cool website called desmos.com. And so if you're looking for graph paper, and maybe you want to print off your own paper, similar to what we have in the video here tonight, and you want to just put it in your notebook to make your graphs, just take them to the next level, is, um, I want to say it's www.desmos.com. And you can then graph your own functions or just print off some, some generic graph paper. And I really like it because it's got like the mini boxes in there and it's just kind of, it makes my graphs look a little better than they usually do. But which one's which here? Now, there is the first log function. Remember, this is the common log, so it's got a base of 10. Which one is log base 10 of x versus which one's log base 2 of x? So I want you to scan these two graphs looking for some defining characteristics that will help you distinguish which one's the common log versus which one's log base 2 of x. For me, what caught my attention was a point like these guys right here in 8 comma 3. So for instance, if x equals 2, I could say, well, log base 2 of 2 equals 1, or log base 2 of 4 equals 2 or log base 2 of 8 equals 3. And so for me, this was definitely log base 2 of x. And you probably noticed this yesterday. As the bases got bigger, the graphs actually got shorter. And this other graph is the common log. We can't even see the point, but just off to the right edge of our screen here, you'd see the graph go through the point 10, 1 because the log of 10 equals 1. Now I want to try to sketch the natural log of x so that we could visually see how it relates to these graphs right here. Now we saw in the last graph that not only does it have um, the same x-intercept as these other functions, but it's also going to pass through the point e comma 1. And that's simply because the natural log of e equals 1. And so I'm going to try to estimate where that is. So I went to 2.718 up to 1, and I'm kind of shooting for that bear right there. It's going to nestle itself in between those two functions and extend in this fashion right here couple of uh, closing comments on this letter E. It's uh, You're probably wondering, what's the big deal? Why is this rascal so important that he gets his own number? Well, unfortunately, we're not going to get into some of the more exciting features of E in this course. Uh, once we get to calculus, then we do a lot of work with E and start to reveal some of his powerful characteristics that make him perhaps the most famous number in the history of math. But strictly by definition, E is the sum of this pattern. See if you can identify the next term. One fourth, the next term was one fifth, and if you kept doing that all the way to infinity, the sum of all of those terms adds up to the number e. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what makes e such a special and exciting number. So again, nice job hanging in there. Hope you feel good about your calculator skills, and we will see you tomorrow.